think we're ready to start, and usually we acknowledge the people who come from New Jersey all the way. Imagine what time they have to get up in the morning in order to come here from New Jersey for the class, right? Four o'clock or something? Four o'clock. And then they drive, and then and Alex plays in the youth orchestra, so then there's a four-hour rehearsal in the afternoon, and then they drive back. It's a big commitment, big commitment. But we have another person who came from a very far distance, from Kentucky, he told me this morning, to hear the class. And I don't want to go into a long story about why, but you said you came because it's made such a difference. You said it's changed your life. Can you, st yeah. I saw at the beginning of COVID, I was not even a, a knowledgeable at all about classical music or I didn't even think I had any interest. And I saw your, I saw your Mozart piece sitting on the bench there at your house by yourself. And I can't explain it, but it, I haven't missed anything since. This is amazing. Well, thank you for coming and thank you for being available. I always say the most important thing is to be available in life. Just available to what's there and grab it and get on a plane and come to Boston to see it in action. So we have a very exciting class today because it's all people who are in the younger age group of people who are either in high school, like this group, and uh, Brian, who's going to play Shostakovich, who's also in high school, and then Nikki, who's the leader of the youth orchestra. And so it's a young group, and that's always very, very exciting to explore that. This first group is one member of it, the group is already in our orchestra. Jane is uh, one of the concert, associate concert master of the youth orchestra and uh, goes to Exeter School and she's brought two of her friends with whom she plays Brahms. And it is Tristan, well named, playing the cello, and Lucy Will, Tristan Price and Lucy Will. And they're going to play the first movement of Brahms' B major trio. I'm very excited to hear them.
for what you're doing. And I think of Brahms as being an enormous figure, a figure of such power and such imagination and such energy. And rather than bring him down to the level of three very commendable young musicians, I want to see whether we can bring these three musicians up to the level of Brahms. Right? And it's a difficult piece to do because it's very ambiguous. What does he mean by allegro con moto? Is that how you have it marked at the beginning? Allegro, yeah, allegro con moto, con brio, allegro con brio. Now that, that's a very striking statement because con brio, you know he knew Beethoven's music inside and out. And con brio for Beethoven, is a very strong statement. All the great works of Beethoven that we know, the Fifth Symphony and the Violin Concerto and the Trio, and they're all marked, you know, the C minor, they're all played with speed and with drive and with power and passion. And, and so he says, Allegro con brio, in a piece that seems so broad and so singing. How can we do that? And you find the beginning very difficult to do and you didn't know how to do it. You were sort of apologetic about it. That first F sharp is so great. Do you know the recording of Myra Hess? Do you know the Myra Hess with Casals and Schneider? Yeah. That, that, you know that? Yeah. Do you remember that first F sharp in yeah. the piano? <gasps> I mean, it's, I, I heard that first when I was about seven and I've never, <gasps> that, that F sharp. So now let me tell you how to play that F sharp. We've got to realize that this is in media res. This is, this is, so let's find something in the middle here. Uh, how would it be if we do just before the first ending? Where, where are we here? Right, so, so if you do from here, then let's do, do, do from this, as, as, as big as you can. Should we go from there? So you choose, you choose a place. Right, that's great. Yeah. Ah, yay. So that pick up to 96. Nin 96. That's 97. one of the... No, 90 what? 96. Right. So that's, that's one of those big Brahms moments, okay? We're going to play it big. And then you're going to do the first ending. Are you ready? Here we go. With who's going to do the other? Are you going to lead? Yeah. Right. <laughs> the fires beginning to bur to to burn here but more and more intense try once again right from there F sharp is the end, end of this build up. So, do, yeah, do, here. So, do this from here. Right. That, there's a ritardando that, that takes you all the way to that F sharp. Do one more time. And when he comes, when he comes, when that F sharp comes, and then you could go back 
to the temp to the Vivace tempo, the Combrio tempo, because you've just pulled like an elastic and then you let it go. So if you just try, but you need to have this fire in the before you begin. Should we do it? Do one more time, and then we'll go. So make this very rich, and when you get to that F sharp, make it rich and full, right? Once should we just go to? Takes a while to get the blood boiling here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Bing. In Brahms, the eighth note is crucial. Don't ever run over the eighth note. Ya ba ba, ba 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 bi ba ba ba. Every eighth note is sung. In Beethoven, it's more a whole four-bar phrase. In Brahms, it's every eighth note. Can we just try once again the same thing? Two, three. Ding. That F sharp, make it sound like the greatest cellist you've ever heard. One last time, isn't it great when you play the eighth note? Try it once again. Two, three. That's the secret of the beginning. So you hold that F sharp and then move con brio, right? So now when we're going to begin the piece, think before you begin. And then you move, right? So you're thinking before. Here we go. More, more. So I'm going to help you now. Ya ba ba bi ba 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 bim two three. Yeah, warm up, warm up sound because he writes, he writes espressivo. Is it? Does he say espressivo here? No, he doesn't. In my edition, he does, but it's it's in two, and it's an allegro con brio, but it's the result of a ritardando. So one, two, three. a little bit more free freedom with the allegro con brio try it again one and two and one two three This is one of the greatest tunes ever written for cello. Play it with such intensity and freedom and love, and she'll be with you. I right, try once again. I'm going to show you what I mean about that F sharp. I think. <laughs> I can't play the notes because I'm not a pianist, but you get the idea. One, two, three, four, one, and two. in two bar units, so not da di da 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 Now it's coming, all right? You're beginning to enjoy, the blood is beginning to warm up here. Well, you've got to do something about the weather. Brahms is great for cold weather, because it warms it up. All right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Now, Tristan, 
Tristan, what is this about? What is this music about? Um, well, it's very passionate music. Very passionate. Great. What else? Um, I don't know. It, it feels almost like a, a love song. It's a, a love you. song, exactly. And not one that necessarily is going to end well. Yeah. Right? So can you... I don't know whether you've had any experience of that in your own life, <laughs> but, but if you have, and speaking of somebody who has, those falling cadence, you are here, I love you, please don't leave me, you're on the tire, I love you so. But is there any hope now? Maybe you'll come back to me. Yes, there's hope. Yeah. Right? So it, it just takes much more out of us than just playing the cello. Right? The cello alone is not enough. You have to go deep into your heart to discover those emotions, those feelings, the sense of hopelessness, hope, joy, love, despair, all of that is there. And it depends on the F sharp in the piano. One and two and one, two, three, four, yeah. Mm, yeah. It, no, it doesn't have any character. That F sharp has to have, what? He has to set this whole incredible thing in motion. Right, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, yeah. Do it again, because I'm, I'm abusing you. Forgive me for interrupting. I'm trying to you get you to feel it more deeply. When you get a little older and you feel these things in your heart, it'll affect your face also because you'll feel the sadness, the longing, the sense of despair in this music. It's some of the saddest music, and it's in major. It's in a major key. You'd think it would be sad. So should we try one more time? <laughs> Once we've got this beginning, the whole thing is going to work. So are you ready for that F sharp? F sharp, F sharp. One, two, three, and one, two, three. comes
now Brahms is beginning to warm this place up. A little applause, I think. Mm -hmm. Don't let your face be separate from your heart and body. Your face shows nothing. And that's partly your age, which is okay, but it's also a habit. It's a bad habit in uh, very important private schools. People don't tend to... You see, if you're feeling deep emotion, inform your face about it. You've got to give your whole being to that, to that sound with a fast free This is a reason to practice, incidentally, more than you're doing. Because you, you're a good cellist, but your cello playing is holding you back from great expression. You know that, right? It's all that math and college applications and all you... Is that the age you are? No, I mean... A few more years. Few more years. Great, great. Put, put it off as long as you can. All right? All right? And think about, think about the heart and the cello and why you play the cello to express the deepest things that human beings are capable of, of expressing. I should try to... What is that? What is the emotion? Beginning? No, that. Oh, you were playing from memory. That's good. Yeah, good. I forgot. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. We, th we think we need the music more than we do. Right. Isn't that right? So, what's the emotion there? Um, it is kind of like. You know, Not kind of anything. Brought. Brahms is never kind of. We've, right. I mean, we're now in a much. It's, it's in a. It's in piano now, and it's more a deeper tone and a darker tone, and I feel it's going into more of a, um, a much sadder place. It a is. It's piano. a sad place, but it's still con brio, yeah. right? It's still yeah. con brio. I call that one buttock playing, because if you play it on two buttocks, you see yourself. It can be the other buttock. Always on one or the other. Right, should we try from there? And your turbulence back there, Lucy. Okay, yeah. From the B, right, the fame, yeah. No, I don't look at, you don't look turbulent. You look as though you're about to play a B. You say, oh, I'm going to play a B. You better be in tune. I've got a nice sound. we we'll get together. No. no. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's play. Play now. <laughs> It's coming. More, more communication. I think you need this off so that now, because then, then it'll match, it'll match his hair. Because it's, uh, do the same thing. Do it, come a little closer. Okay. You, you, yeah, come a little closer. Right, right now. All right, here we go. B. B. Are you ready? B. Yeah. Exhausted, exhausted. Da, da, da. Go on, go on. You're doing great. That's, that's better. And get your face involved too. Everything you have. When you get into life full blown with relationships and lost relationships and despair and anger and upset, you need every part of yourself, including your face. You'll learn that. They don't teach you that in school. They don't say, oh, can we have a class in facial expression? No, they don't do that. They teach you poetry so you'll get inside the heart of a great poet. 
but it only comes to being when it's on your, Keats said this, nothing means anything until you feel it on your pulses. I love that, the idea that you have to be so emotionally engaged that the music changes you, and if, because it changes you, it changes them. And you know there are 200,000 people watching, or maybe 700,000. Do you get that? And you're teaching them something. And this gentleman who came all the way from Kentucky or Kansas or wherever it was out there, a yeah, long way, to hear something that he couldn't hear at home. Do you get that? He couldn't hear it at home. So we have to put ourselves out with everything we have. We're going to do it one more time. And then we're going to go on. Are you ready? So burning, burning, yearning, feel, And try a little bit of... You know, it's not acting so much, it's just responding. You might have said at the beginning, the most important thing is to be available. Be available to the emotion. Right? Let it in. Let it in and let it affect everything in you. Your bow, your vibrato, your face, your body, your one buttock, everything. Are ready? One, two, and... <laughs> Stop. That was great. That was great. That was great. But I just wanted to get him excited because he's about he's about to play the most beautiful and important tune he's ever played in his life. But the F sharp was great. Did you see it? Did you hear the F sharp? It was great. The F sharp was great. This music takes everything out of us we have, right? We can't just play it. We have to be it, we have to live it, we have to strive for it, we have to love it so much that it just takes everything we have. Should we go on? Or should we do that one more time, that F sharp, so you get another chance? Imagine you were a, a great actor. Tristan, do you know something about your forebear, Tristan, as in Tristan and Isolde? You know what he went through? Yeah, you know why? Yeah. Right. You read it in a book. All right. Now be it. All right. Be it. Be it in every in with your vibrato and your bow and your face and your heart. So now you've learned the bisha. So when you play this the next time, you're going to have to work up that much of heat in the music before you begin. Right before you play a note. 
And th then when you play that F sharp, it's the result of some of the most intense music that has ever been experienced. And the piece hasn't even begun yet. Right, can you do that? So we'll imagine, 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 and you're ready for it. Ready, 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 F sharp. Yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you pull a little, a little bit more? As if you're pulling a piece of elastic and then letting it go. Two, three. So, do, do you find that incredibly beautiful? You don't look as though you find it incredibly beautiful. Because you know you've been very well trained to be very demure. But I wish you were a little mad. You know, a little mad. So there was some... You see, the secret of the Combrio is... Look, no buttock. Right? It's not one buttock. There's no buttock. Here, try one. And you know, we're told nowadays we're not supposed to touch people. Bullshit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Answer. Because you, you tell a you really I mean you tell a ballet teacher don't touch your dancers come on how are you going to do it unless we have physical contact so you don't mind okay here we go one two three and one and one thing you haven't understood is that it, da di da da di da love you not love you not equal one two
so sad, sad. Now look, I, I have something, I have something to say to all of you. Don't let the environment in which you live, work and relate hold you back in your spiritual and emotional life. Now I went to a boarding school, like you, and there was a lot of holding back. Also a lot of lashing out. It was very unpleasant at our school because I grew up in a different era. If a prefect got upset with a smaller boy, they beat them, right, because that was available. We don't do that anymore. But we have other means to keep our emotions suppressed. And the reason you play music is to counteract that suppression. And don't let the suppression and the limitation and the restrictions that you find all around you the rules, the demands, the competition, the college applications, the, all that stuff that is driving you crazy, frankly, and some people beyond crazy. Don't let that stop your natural growth and ebullience and effectiveness as a communicating emotional human being. Because the world does not need more intellect, it needs more heart. Do you understand that? It does not need more intellect. It has intellect in such abundance that we don't know what to do with the intellect. But it can be used in such negative ways and such, like a weapon. The only hope is music. The only hope is what Brahms has taught us. And if you push it aside and keep it in its, in its closet, it won't have the effect that it has. But I tell you, there is not one person in this room right now who has not been deeply emotionally ev uh, affected by Brahms, and therefore by themselves. Because that kind of intensity is not available on a normal daily basis. You understand? It depends on us. Right? So that F sharp. <laughs> <laughs> You understand? In order to play that F sharp, you have to have been through so much. You have to have been through the whole f exposition of the piece in order to understand that the F sharp is the end before it all gets going. Right? You got it? And if you get it with your brain, then allow your body and your feelings to match your intellect. Because rarely does that happen. And particularly not in conservatories and in uh, science schools and in boarding schools, wonderful though those institutions are, it's not a place for those things to flourish. And so they depend on the musicians, you understand? You are the people who carry the sacred flame. And don't let you be pushed off track by that for a moment. 
You know, I got a letter from one of the members of the youth orchestra yesterday saying she couldn't come to rehearsal because she had a meeting with her science professor at MIT. And I wrote back and said, <laughs> give her free tickets to the concert All right. on March the 10th. And tell her why you come for four hours on Saturday afternoon in addition to your work at science. So I can't tell you strongly enough how I'm very glad you came and I'm glad you came at this stage because you're about, you're like chrysalises about to become butterflies. But whether you become a butterfly or just another functioning chrysalis depends on whether you understand Brahms. And isn't it amazing because Brahms keeps teaching us every day. He goes on and on. He never gets tired. <laughs> he never says, oh, okay, I've done enough. No. Brahms is always available for us to learn about how to live full, full expressive human lives. And that's what he gives us. And don't let him in the closet. Don't keep him in the closet. Okay, well done, all of you. You've done really beautiful. Brian is uh, in the youth orchestra also, in the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra. And we just went on tour last summer to Greece. And uh, he, didn't, he, he said he didn't want to go because he had to be coxswain in his school yacht, in his uh, rowing team. <laughs> and I said, Brian, don't be silly. <laughs> <laughs> Brian has won a competition, which is great, which is he's going to play the Shostakovich concerto with the Wellesley Symphony. It was a competition. All high school students, right? Yes. Yeah, great. And he won. Terrific.
is amazing. Amazing. You've, you've just made so much progress. That's really, it's really so exciting. Was it two years ago when you played the elegy in the class? I think so. Yeah. Two years. Uh, he played in, in the class. We were all closed in, in, in during the, the COVID days. Um, but we went on through, through the internet and, and he played an elegy and it was a kind of turning point for you about your seriousness and devotion and it's, it's almost unbelievable what you've done in that time. It's very, very moving. I mean, that's the great thing about this age is extraordinary things can happen at this age. Not at your age. <laughs> yes. But uh, dramatic transformations. It's really, it's, it's, very, it's very brilliant. And you, you deserve to have won that competition. It's going to be very exciting. So, and incidentally, they were playing together for the first time. They'd never played. Just a little of, just recognition. <laughs> we say it over and over and over again how great Dina is, but we have to re remember it. But it's a great privilege you have now to play with an orchestra. Right? You have to do more than just play well. You have to be so strong and so in charge that the whole orchestra is going to feel it right to the back of the second violins and the double basses. Right? And you're not doing that yet. You're near it, but you're not doing that. Partly you're struggling against the cello. It's not a good enough cello for you, which is a great... Uh, fortunately, your father is in the room, so he can, he can <laughs> pay attention. But you, you deserve a better cello, which is great, great discovery, because I think music is going to be, I don't know if you're going to be a professional musician, I don't interfere, but music is going to be very important to you, right? So here's what I'm going to tell you, rather than sort of instruct you, because that, that you don't need. Who's your teacher, incidentally? Uh, Eugene Kim. Eugene Kim, who was my student. Wow. Well, would you give him my compliments and oh. tell him he's done a really, really fine job, yeah. Um, he was my cello student many, many years ago. He's a great musician. So I, the best thing I can do is tell you a story. I was 21 in England, and I went into the Royal Festival Hall. The year was 1960, and I heard this piece for the first time. It was the first performance, and Rostropovich was playing it, and it was the first time anybody had heard Rostropovich. And he played that movement, and it was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Nobody had ever heard anything like it, and the audience was so stunned, all of us were so stunned, that at the end of the concerto, there was an ovation that the only comparison I've ever seen is the crowd at a final in the World Cup football. Right? <laughs> they went crazy, as if it was nothing to do with music. And in a sense, it isn't to do with music. It's to do with persecution and with suppression and anger and terror and no way out. There's no way. Do you notice the cello never stops playing? Because you know what, what would happen if the cello stopped playing? He'd be killed. And your protagonist or your, your enemy is the horn. And the horn is like a predatory animal chasing a, a creature, right? Trying to kill it. And that's life in Soviet Russia. And I don't need to look at Dina for her to nod her head because I know what her life is like. And you know, we are not far off that right now. So that kind, I think this generation is experiencing what Shostakovich experienced every day. No way out, no way out. And he lived in that terror, and his face, you know, he never smiled. Mysteriously, he smiled in his coffin. They say that his, his face had a smile in his coffin. But 
otherwise. He came here to Boston during the festival, the Russian festival, <laughs> smoking, incessantly smoking, smoking, smoking. And he was so nervous and so ill at ease. And he was one of the greatest. And you know who was at that concert? Benjamin Britten. My teacher, Benjamin Britten, was at that concert. And Benjamin Britten went crazy about he'd never heard this music. Nobody had heard it. It was the first performer. Can you imagine that I carried that memory? That's what it was like. And Benjamin Britten went round afterwards. I didn't go because I didn't know Ross Republic that, but I got to know him later. But Britten went round, and they made a lifelong friendship until Britten died. And Rostropovich, he wrote the pieces for, you know, it's just, this was a very intense time musically. The Russians were dominating musically. The greatest cellist who had ever lived suddenly had appeared. And, you know, he played, he didn't play like the Latin cellos, you know, with warmth and with freedom and with, you know, like Casals and Casado and Fournier and Tortelier and all those great Latin, they were all Latin. He was Russian. And he sat there like a bank clerk, you know, with this grim face. And out of his cello came the most terrifying sound I'd ever heard in my life. And if you could get some of that feeling, it would be even, even at the first rehearsal. So you walk in and you're not, you're not a young person uh, who's won a competition. You're somebody with a message to give to the people in the orchestra that they actually didn't know until you come along. Do you think we can do that? When that that's a Jewish theme. One of the things Shostakovich discovered, he loved, he wasn't Jewish, but he loved Jewish people and he loved Jewish culture and music. And his music is full of Jewish music. He even wrote pieces, Jewish folk pieces which I perform, they're fantastic. And so you have to take on a Jewish uh, cry there, clug and what Mahler called clug and the despairing cry. So when you begin, it's like asking a question. Bum, 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 and the answer comes here. Bum, 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 bum. Should we just try the opening and see if we can get that feeling? And, and don't hang around a lot. You know, Rostropovich was always in a hurry. I remember him playing the Bach C major suite, and the chair was out in Symphony Hall, and he came in. He, had, he came in like this with his cello. He was holding his cello like that, and he went, I swear, the first note was played before his bottom hit the chair. I mean, just like that. And all this sitting around and waiting and touching your glasses and tune. Don't do that. Just start, right? And then people will say, wow, he has some business to get to. Right? Here we go. And run. Every note. Thank you. 
I felt <laughs> right, right. You know, while that was happening, I felt something bursting out of you, Dina, which had been waiting to burst out. A real a profound anger at what's happened to your country. And it can only be expressed in music, really, with that kind of violence and relentless intensity. Can you play without glasses? Yeah. Great, do. <laughs> because... <laughs> I'll, I'll give them back. <laughs> this, this is the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra. Well, you know, it's full of 115 kids that play this way. I mean, no wonder people are stunned by that, that orchestra. Because this is... When you play like that, you're not holding anything back. You know, you're really giving everything. And sometimes the aggression of those chords is almost comical. And it's supposed to be. You know, there was something about this mad character with the bald head, it looked like a bank clerk, going, <laughs> you know, just what, what, what? It's, it's, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't polite company. You know? And it releases something in us as, as human beings that is not normally available. And Dina, you are just amazing how you made music, how you made that come alive in the orchestra with the horn pounding. It was really absolutely phenomenal. And it's because you understand, you feel it. You know what culture is, is culture is knowing. That's what culture is, is knowing what it's like, who those people were, what they were up against. You know what caused this piece to be written was his friend Pasternak, who is a great writer, had been blamed and, and punished by the government for writing Dr. Shivago, of all things. It's, it's so he, he, was, he was persecuted, like Navalny is now. Same thing. You know about Navalny? The, I don't know if Geraldine... Geraldine, are you in the room? Is Geraldine here? He, Geraldine was going to come. She's a dear friend, and she made a film about Navalny, which was just nominated for an Oscar. And she was going to come to it this morning, but this is this is a, a world of such cruelty, such unrelenting cruelty and carelessness that people like Shostakovich were destroyed, basically. But still, they were great artists, and through their music, they could get that message out into the world, and it's still powerful today. It's not limited by the facts. I mean, I was 19, in 1960, I was 21, and we were vaguely aware Khrushchev was in power, and he, you remember the m missile crisis in Cuba that came later with Kennedy? This was, uh, um, this was uh, he, he was just on his first visit to America, and everybody was in, in, in anxiety about, like now, the same thing, nothing has changed, really. But when Rostropovich appeared, I don't even remember who the orchestra was, probably the London Symphony. I don't remember what else was played. I don't remember who was conducting. I just remember this astonishing figure. And you were doing that right now, with a little help. <laughs> <laughs> but all I'm doing, you know, what is my role? My role is to unlock what's already there. It was there. I didn't put it in, you, you had it inside you. But there are lots of conversations which keep you from doing it. Conversations about propriety and competition and parents and schools and, you know. And, and I said the same to the trio, don't let all that keep you back. Really. And particularly you're in an orchestra, you've got a whole orchestra waiting for you, play like that. And if you make a mistake, how fascinating. <laughs> Don't play for, to avoid mistakes. Don't play to avoid mistakes. Don't live to avoid mistakes. Go for it. Right. And when you make a mistake, clear it up, learn from it, move on. Right. It's not about that. When you play the very difficult, you're looking at your fingers. I don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> I don't think you need to do that, right?
but you're great, you're doing fantastically well. You have a problem, you may have to become a musician. <laughs> yeah, that's a very serious problem. <laughs> And your father's probably saying, no, please, no, no, please, the sciences are safer. Actually, it's not true. Music is safe. You know why? Because people need music, always they need music. And they need great musicians. And if you have something burning inside you to give away, I'm not pushing, I never advise people about their career. People ask me a lot, you know, what should I do? And I tell them a story, which was somebody came to me once and asked for advice. Should he be an organist or a comedian? <laughs> I said, well, obviously an organist. Well, it was Dudley Moore. <laughs> Do you know who that is? He was one of the most successful comedians America has ever seen. <laughs> so I was wrong about that. <laughs> I don't give advice, but I can give you a kind of blessing, if you like. I mean, not a religious blessing, but a, a blessing of courage which is, you, you're remarkable, and the progress you've made in the last two years has, is just spectacular. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. So congratulations. You know, when we played the show, we did the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony in Greece last summer, and you almost missed it, you scoundrel, because he wanted to row instead, or rather <laughs> tell the people how to row <laughs> in the back of the boat. But, I, 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 I discouraged that decision. Anyway, but do you remember the feeling of that orchestra playing the final section of the Shostakovich Fifth? It's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Well, look, congratulations, and I'm very glad you came this morning, and I'm particularly glad that you came along with Dina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nikki Nagavi is the, one of the concert masters of the Youth Philharmonic Orchestra. And she's a great, she's more than a great violinist, she's a great human being. And I'm very glad. She's going to play a piece by a, Mrs. H. A. A. Beach. And I'll explain why she's called that in a minute, but let's hear her play. It's a play, it's a piece called Romance. What? Your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> H A A, Mrs. H A A Beach. You need music? No, great, wonderful. Nikki, welcome. Thank you. Yes.
beautiful. Great, beautiful. Well, that'll, that's going to become a pop, uh, a pop sensation. So look, you, you, you've got to get, this is a very, very special young woman. Most of the people that I work with, you've, those of you who've watched me teaching a lot, um, it always seems to be about bringing people out more. Not Nikki. <laughs> Nikki's already out there. I mean, she, she's, a, she's an example of somebody who lives fully out in the world and brings people along with her. She's a great leader. And she's a great teacher. She's the, one of the leaders, the current concertmaster of the youth orchestra. And everybody looks up to her. Everybody follows her. She inspires everybody. And you can see why. Because you, you're, you're completely available, Nikki. And it's a wonderful, wonderful quality. And I'll never forget you, even if I live another 50 years. So that's a great thing. And the world's found out about it. She has a, 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 a Instagram, whatever you call it. <laughs> what is it? Last time I looked, it was 99,000 or something. What is it now? 110,000 people follow her daily, right? And, and there's a reason, because of that intensity and the warmth and the expressiveness and the lack of self-consciousness and all those wonderful, wonderful qualities that you have. So I have nothing to add to that. But I have a conversation about this piece with you. I didn't know it. You played El Elgin, is it, or Elgin? Elgin, yeah, like the Elgin marbles, yeah. Do you know what the Elgin marbles are? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, right. They're being moved, finally. <laughs> anyway, uh, very beautiful pianist, and that's great. I wondered, and it's just a question, whether you're playing this a little too fast. And the, the danger of this piece, it becomes a little sentimental, a little... Um, now, corny, what's the word? It's a, a little bit, um, yeah, sentimental, a little bit like a pop song. I think it's actually very rather deep music. And I found something rather amusing, which I think will interest you. And it may be wrong, but if you take the opening, just play the opening. You, you have it there. Just, yeah. <laughs> Get up.
It's a thought. It's a yes, thought. I don't know. That's a great question. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. This, it, see, I wonder whether she knew the Mala. <laughs> she was a very interesting woman. She lived in the shadow of her husband, as every woman did at that time. The reason she was called Mrs. H.A.A. -A Hart Beach, the reason she was called that is because every woman had to go by the name of her husband until he died. Then she was free. And then she was Amy Beach. And she started concertizing and composing, and, and she turned out to be quite an amazing composer and player. And one thing that I wondered whether you might add to your already incredibly beautiful expressiveness is a certain reticence that doesn't come naturally to you, because you couldn't be more different than a proper English, if, uh, New, New England, uh, lady living on Beacon Street, you know, because your your wonderful free expressiveness that I'm always trying to get people to be more expressive, but in your case, I wonder whether you could be a little bit less expressive, <laughs> in the sense of being a little bit more demure, and letting the music speak with its own beauty and some of these very special harmonies. I think he, she knew Marla, and not personally, but I think she knew there's, uh, there are many harmonies. So should we just try? It's an experiment. It's an andante, it's sostenuto, right? It's an andante, andante, espressivo, right? So very expressive, but an andante is, a, is actually a slow movement. And the way you play it, it's like a, a, a pop song. And I think it diminishes it. I don't know. I'm not on very strong ground because I don't know the piece. But can we try it and see whether we can get that feeling? So I'll conduct it a little like Mahler. One. Yeah, imagine that in the cellos. And one. No, not, not even. Nothing in Mahler is even. Just jump up a moment. Look, look. You get that? So fluid, fluid. Three, four, one. Lord. It's still a little stuck. Can I, I, I don't want to, to be pedantic, but let me just show you how this works in the mala. Where, where, where is here? Look. Oh, yeah, here. So it starts like this. Very soft, but very uh, fluid. Three, four, one. Yes. Now, don't come too early with that chord in the left hand. One. Your piano playing is very piano playing. If you can stop thinking of it as a percussive instrument and think of it as a string instrument, very, very smooth, then it will bring out her sound more without her having to play more. Right, so very, very legato. And it's, I'm not a pianist, so I don't know, but let me just show you, I go back to Mahler. 
uh, the wrong piece, sorry, here. Look, this is... Everything is fluid like that, very, very fluid. Should we just try? And it's pianissimo, right? Very soft. Everything like strings, cello and one. No, 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 cellos don't play like that. They play. Pianissimo, pianissimo. You know what gave me this idea? That very bar, play that bar. I, oh my God, those are, those are Malarian accents. It's, it's beautiful, isn't it, actually? It's wonderful, wonderful. Brings out more variety, more seriousness of, I think it's a serious piece. It, it can, it, easily be thrown off as a you know a popular bonbon you know but i think it's actually very deep so can i hear those and when you get to those so do i love when the th third this third section comes when it finally lets loose should we try there i don't have the bar numbers Yeah. Never, never be her equal, always a, a shadow. Mm -hmm. right. You see, it makes all the difference because when you do that, suddenly her sound shines. Otherwise, it's a little strained if it's equal. Mm -hmm. It's a very good thing to know. My, my first wife was an amazing pianist and she, she played with Yo-Yo for 13 years as his pianist. And she always made the instrumentalists sound better than they would without her. That was her job, to make the violinists, Young or Kim, they all came to play with her and they said, I just sound better with Patricia than I do with anybody else. Isn't that right? So that's your job now.
cello di odi tari
beautiful. I don't know. You know, it's so interesting. There were, there were no recordings in those days. Right. There, there were no recordings, so we don't know. It's become a kind of pop song mm -hmm. with that kind of a little sentimental, and this is not at all what you're doing, not at all sentimental. And it's a real undante, so it's something to think about. And you know, this is an interpretation class, so it's not as if there's a right way or this is how it ought to be. It's more, huh, maybe, how would it be if, what if? It's a kind of a what if class. And, and you, br you both bring wonderful qualities. Your playing became very, very beautiful during that. At the beginning, it was a little just heavy, a little um, too much for her. But this was lovely, what you just did, very lovely. And that brings out the best in her playing. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit more simplicity in your playing, which I love, and fits the character of Mrs. H.A.A. A. Beach. <laughs> she, of course, burst out of that particular box and became Amy Beach and was quite a powerhouse in the, in the women's movement. And her friend, for whom she wrote this piece, became a big powerhouse in the... In, doing lots of things for the first time for violinists in this country. So it's very, I find that a very beautiful piece. Something to think about, all right? That's, if you go away with something to think about, we haven't wasted our time. So thank you very much. And if I may just add one thing, thank you for the generosity of spirit with which you bring to everything you do. And it affects everybody around you, including me. So. It's a, it's a model of the way young people can be in the world, just giving, generous, open, available, warm, loving, and it creates a beautiful atmosphere, a beautiful environment for, for music and human beings to grow. So it's lovely, thank you. Thank you, Maestro, for creating opportunities like this and yeah. for guiding us as young musicians yeah. to uh, grow into our full potential. I would say a huge part of the reason I am an open person is from the very first moment I watched one of these interpretation classes on YouTube. Really? Yes. I wow. remember the moment. Wow. So, thank you. That's like our friend from Kentucky, even better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> that wonderful. Well, you see, this is not this is not a cult and it's not a person. It's not about me. It, I'm, as I always say, a good vicar. And the vicar who makes the mistake of thinking they come to see him gets taken away in a white van. You know, that's, it's not about that. It is about an environment in which we open ourselves to the possibility of what music has to offer. So thank you. A big thank you. Well done.